Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. The Appalachian Mountain Range in eastern North America spans 1,500 miles from Newfoundland in Canada to central Alabama in the United States. Formed 480 million years ago, the Appalachians were historically as tall as the mighty Rocky Mountains in Western North America and the Alps in Europe. The Appalachians are also one of the most biodiverse regions in North America. Countless fauna and flora call these mountains home, most notably salamanders and other amphibians that need moist environments and leaf cover to thrive. However, these mountains have undergone intense deforestation and modification since Europeans first arrived in the 1500s. Several charismatic species were extirpated from the region, including one of North America's most famous deer species, elk. The last eastern elk was shot in the mid-1800s, and the mountains fell silent for nearly a century and a half. Today, elk are back in the Appalachians thanks to dedicated conservationists and state governments working together to restore elk populations. As you can imagine, though, undertaking such a huge endeavor was not without challenges. In growing elk herds in a densely populated area of the United States is also not an easy task. So how was elk brought back to the state of Tennessee in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains? What went into finding a source population, relocating the herd, and growing the herd? after it was established in its new home? And most importantly, how are they faring today? To teach us about elk restoration in the Appalachians, in this episode, I'm sitting down with Lisa Mueller, PhD, professor and assistant director in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Tennessee. Lisa was part of the team that arranged the elk relocation in the early 2000s, and has been in charge of monitoring the herd ever since. She knows these elk better than anyone else and is passionate about helping the herd grow and thrive. Lisa and I have a fantastic time exploring her story and how she became the lead of the Elk Restoration Project in Tennessee. The history of elk in the Appalachians, the day elk returned to Tennessee's mountains, the innovative conservation tech she and her team is using to monitor the herd, her struggles along the way, and her hopes for the future. Super fun note, Lisa was actually introduced to me by the same person that wrote a new review for the show, Eric Shiflett. Eric was a part of our first listener meetup and gave so much great feedback for me to employ to make the show even better, so thank you, Eric. And on Apple Podcast, Eric said, quote, These podcasts are a great way to learn new and different topics about our natural world. Listening to episodes while vegetation sampling certainly makes the time go by faster. Brooke is a naturally enthusiastic human and it shows through her hosting style. Each episode has a good balance of scientifically driven information without being too overwhelming for listeners that may not have a background in wildlife or research. Nerds like me love the numbers, though, end quote. (laughs) Oh, yes, Eric, I love diving into good science without making everybody's eyes glaze over. (laughs) Thanks for pointing that out. All right, everyone, please enjoy this fun, science-filled conversation with Lisa. Well, hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today and telling your story and everything you know to the whole rewildology community because we have a lot to discuss today. But before we get to the amazing work that you're doing today and this topic that we're going to talk about for quite a while, do you remember when in your life you wanted to work with wildlife? Was there like a particular moment or how did that evolve for you as, as a child? 
Well, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words, and it's it's great talking with you today. I always enjoyed animals. I have to admit that's probably where it came from. And I had a, a he was basically a backyard horse named Spot, cleverly enough. And uh, <laughs> I remember summers, you know, just spending as much time as I possibly could outdoors with spot you know and we go on trail rides we go swimming in the river and i think that's where my love of the outdoors came from and then when i went to college i didn't realize you could major in wildlife that was that was a, a new one for me <laughs> and so you know i loved animals so the you know oh you got to major in pre-vet and then i found out that there was such a thing as a wildlife degree and uh, that was how I got started. <laughs> was that a big switch for you? Do you remember how you discovered wildlife research? And was that a hard decision to switch from pre-vet to that? Or was it like, oh, it's, this, is, this is it. Like veterinary school, get out of the freaking way. I'm going to do this. What was that like for you? It pretty much was, yeah. Um, hey, this is what I want to do. <laughs> so I... I guess I met somebody that was in wildlife. I think that was when I first realized that was an option. And uh, they were talking about their coursework and what they kind of things they did. And then I ended up doing some, I guess it, it, it wasn't officially called undergraduate research, but it was kind of along those lines. And I worked with morning doves and there was a captive dove facility at Auburn University. And, um, I worked with them and um, did some wild bird trapping and helped some other graduate students on their projects and just loved it. And so that's kind of how I got it involved. And yeah, it's it's a it's a great way to go. That's awesome. And so, OK, did you have a particular fondness for birds or morning doves or what was the question that you asked that? you got excited about enough to do it for a while, right? So that was your master's, am I correct? Okay, okay. That's a long time thing, studying doves. It was, why were they interesting to you? What did you study? <laughs> well, and it, interestingly enough, I think it's the physiology side. And so it was a reproductive physiology project. And to be honest, morning doves are just fascinating. They produce this substance called crop milk, which is basically analogous to mammalian milk. And it's and it's thickening and an um, increased number of cells in the crop that develop. And when they have young for about the first six to eight days, they actually regurgitate that sloughing off of the crop and they regurgitate to that to the young. And that's what they feed their young. And it's actually the same hormone that's involved in milk production is the same hormone involved in crop milk production, even though they're totally different things. Um, so physiologically, they are just really kind of amazing. And because it's such a energy intensive form of feeding their young, they <laughs> they actually only have two young every time. They can't have more oh. than two. It's only two because they couldn't afford to to feed more than two. And both males and females have to produce this milk. So that's the other thing that's kind of cool about it. And it's the same prolactin, the same hormone in males and females. They both parents produce this milk. They have to have both parents in the first six days or so. So physiologically, it's it's really kind of an interesting part of all of this is that they are kind of incredible reproduction wise and how it fits with their ecology and they have a very low reproductive rate but they start in january around here in tennessee and then they can continue breeding until september ish and so they don't have many young at a time but they have them every 30 days or so so that's how they're able to reproduce so successfully <laughs> Oh, and are they monogamous or every single time they have a new clutch of eggs, are, are they different partners? That's just why I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's fascinating because they are monogamous at least for a season. And it's oh, okay. they may, might be even longer than um, the season, you know, but at least for that, that year, they they do 
stick together, which is kind of cool. Oh my gosh. I'm going to appreciate them so much more now. I have, hear them all the time, every day. Like, oh, that's a morning dove. <laughs> like, right. There's so many, so many pairs out here in the, the forest surrounding me right now. And so, okay, okay. Fascinating. I'm sure that that, that actually is really interesting, especially from a hormone level that they are creating essentially, yeah, bird milk, which that's not the proper thing, but you know, an equivalent uh, that's really similar to mammal. So then what's the transition to deer? How did you get from doves to an animal that's significantly bigger and <laughs> why tell deer? Well, and it, it, yeah, that is kind of an interesting story. So the person that I worked for my master's was also good friends with someone um, that was at University of Georgia and he also did physiology work and so I wanted to stick with the physiology part and I actually thought that I would end up working on waterfowl to be honest <laughs> and uh, I had no intention of working on deer but it just happened that there was a deer project that came open and it was a reproductive physiology project and so that was kind of the transition i guess going from morning doves to white-tailed deer quite a big difference but um all within that scope of reproductive physiology i guess it would be the umbrella so then what did you end up studying for them so i did look at um oddly enough it, it was a birth control for deer project and mm. The reason that's important is it's really good to have wildlife people actually look at this and not just maybe humane society or something because it turns out that there were unintended consequences and problems with the birth control basically and you know you would want those problems to be made everyone aware of right for example if if you cause them to keep cycling, but they're not getting pregnant. So in other words, you've taken this peak breeding season, which typically around here, it's November-ish. And that's when you have most of your road kill. That's when you have a lot of deer movement. Now you've extended that through March, April, because you the females are still cycling. They're just not getting bred. And so you continue to have these deer chasing movements and the increased roadkill and those other problems. So it's not a simple matter. And it was funded actually by the Park Service, which is also kind of interesting because they had problems in terms of how to control deer and maintain the park features that they wanted without hunting. And so a lot of national parks like Gettysburg National Park does not have hunting allowed in their enabling legislation to set up the park. And so that is not an option for controlling deer. It's not an option for culling deer. But they want to maintain these historic battlefields the way they were back at the time. And so if you have this large herbivore that you can't control, then you have some issues. So it's really a complicated matter and it's it is odd to to think about birth control in wildlife and it really hasn't shown to work but once again i do think you need to have wildlife people involved to understand the biology of the species and to be able to look at the unintended consequences in addition to the fact that they um would cycle for a while and then eventually they would get bred and they would get pregnant and so now you've also screwed up when they're dropping fawns mm. so instead of dropping fawns normally in the spring now you're dropping fawns right before the winter and so you know unintended consequences again about killing fawns and so they, there's a lot of issues so what was the solution did you find one or were or were you just trying to answer whether or not the birth control worked? I guess it was more of whether or not it would work. And so we did not find a solution, basically. But I did get to work on a lot of side projects, too, which were really interesting. And I, I think I enjoyed that a lot and had some really great supportive 
fellow grad students and it was a it was a a great opportunity to learn from their projects as well as um work on my project mm. and so i guess i think the next logical question then is the main topic of today which is elk how did how we've made we're making another transition at least this one is in the same ungulate group of animals but mm -hmm. how did you get from then white-tailed deer to the, well now i would imagine the mammal love of your life elk <laughs> how did you get to them <laughs> which is also kind of interesting i guess in in that um so when i started here it was I started in 99 here at University of Tennessee, and the state agency had been in contacts with trying with several people in the eastern US and also several stocking sources to try to restore elk back into the Tennessee mountains, because historically they were here. And so it ended up being because of my deer background and, you know, it's a little different working with elk, but there's a lot of similarities, much more so than perhaps the morning does to the white tail deer. <laughs> but you know, that was about the the timing wise. I guess it was I happened to be at the right place at the right time when they were bringing elk in, and so that was kind of an amazing time. I mean, it was rushed in terms of from my perspective of, you know, okay, we got to get all this together as quickly as possible, collars and the infrastructure to monitor these animals once they're released. And so the first animals were released in uh, December of 2000. So, you know, it was, it was a fast and furious time in my life, I suppose, <laughs> but it was also one of the most exciting to be part of this restoration project that was going on. And Kentucky had already started in about 95, I think, their elk herd restoration. And luckily, Tennessee's herd is, or the restoration zone is next door to Kentucky's restoration zone. So it was helpful to have resources in Kentucky as well that could help us with any questions we had. Yeah, that. Yeah, talk about being at the right place at the right time. And maybe to help all of us understand this this theme or or this reintroduction more, could you maybe go into a little bit of the history of the elk in maybe specifically in the Appalachians, but also maybe on a broader scale? So maybe get catch us and bring us up to speed on before pre-2000, December 2000, what had happened to elk, especially in this region, up until that point? Yeah, that's a that is an interesting question. And the eastern elk, which is a was a unique subspecies, actually they they um, determined that it went extinct. So the closest relatives are the Rocky Mountain elk subspecies and the Manitoban subspecies. And you know, elk are pretty adaptive. They can live in a wide variety of habitats. So elk were gone in the east and i'm um, not sure the dates of the rest of the eastern part of the u.s but in tennessee the last elk was um i think reported shot in 1865 so they've been gone from the landscape for a very long time and you know of course it's difficult in the eastern u.s to find areas where you can release a very large herbivore and you have enough open spaces that's not going to cause problems for humans. And so, you know, several states have embarked on this restoration of this large charismatic species that used to be here. And Kentucky was by far had the largest restoration project and they brought in animals. Like I said, I think they started maybe in 95. And so they brought in animals mostly from the Western United States. So they came ultimately from Yellowstone stock. And about the time that Tennessee was thinking about it, there was the issue of chronic wasting disease out West, but that was not something that any of us thought would ever come in the Eastern US. And so it wasn't real high on the radar, but there, was a herd in um, Alberta, Canada, and 
um, Elk Island National Park. And so it's a small national park that's east of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. And they had been monitoring the herd for a long time for many different diseases. And so when you think about moving animals, you always have to worry about their biological package. You know, what parasites, what viruses, what, what are they carrying with them? Because you don't want to release something that, that wasn't here. And so because that herd had been monitored so closely, that's why they chose Elk Island and, um, as opposed to the western states where Kentucky got their animals. And so Elk Island is kind of interesting because at the time it was actually very beneficial to them as well because it's a high fenced national park that basically has animals on both sides of a major highway and each side separately fenced. And they trap animals on both sides of the highway and then they, they move them to a central holding facility and then there they're able to ship them out to different places so elk island was a stocking source for actually herds in ontario herds at the great smoky mountains national park and also in tennessee and land between the lakes in western kentucky western tennessee where they come together they also received animals from there and it worked out well for elk island because they have it's a small national park, it's high fence, they have elk, they have moose, they have whitetails, they have bison, and they don't have any natural predators besides coyotes, which aren't very effective on the large hoofstock. So they needed a means of controlling the herd. And so it worked out well, and we were able to get animals and they were basically um, driven from Alberta down to Tennessee without stopping. and. They were held overnight in a trailer and then the trailer doors were open and we had elk in Tennessee. <laughs> Do you remember that day? Were you there? I was. I I remember very vividly because, you know, it was there was a lot going on, right? And so we were going to be responsible for monitoring all the movements. And so these were all the animals before they were released when they were worked up at Elk Island National Park, we were able to put radio collars on them. And so before shipping, they all had collars and they were all tested for different diseases. And, you know, we tried to make sure it was, everything was as healthy as possible. But once they're released, of course, you have no <laughs> control anymore, you know? So um, we were monitoring their movements and survival. Very interested in how they, well they would do on the new landscape. So how many did you get originally? What was the original herd size? So I guess in the first five years, there were various releases of different sizes. I think the biggest one was maybe 80 animals at once, but various sizes. And it, we ended up the first five years releasing 167 elk. And then there were um, 30 something released about uh, eight years and they either came from Elk Island National Park or Land Between the Lakes, which is that area in Western Kentucky, which ultimately got theirs from Elk Island. Oh, and so where, where were they initially released? And then ha have they migrated far since then? I guess, what is their, what is their current spread now from that day I can only imagine that day, how that must have felt like all the anticipation, everything, and they finally release the doors and they're free. Yeah. Since then, how, how, far, how far have they moved? Is there a current estimate on how big the herd is and how big they've grown? Yeah. How, how has happened since then? Yeah. So it's, um, it's interesting because they, they are capable of moving long distances for sure, you know? But they are still mostly around the area where they were released, which is Royal Blue Wildlife Management Area, which is now the North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area. But they spread north and south from there, but mostly they are in that area of the Cumberland Mountains in Tennessee. So they're still fairly close. Now, we've had some that went to Oak Ridge and, you know, various places. So it's, it's been interesting from that standpoint, but for the most part, you know, they're, 
still within the elk restoration zone, which was the hope that they would stay there because it was a good place for a lot of public lands and not much interaction um, with human interests. So it was hoped there wouldn't be much elk human conflict. And there's been some, but you know, it hasn't been too bad. So they are mostly still there. And as far as numbers go, it's it's it is kind of hard to get a good handle on numbers. And I will say it's probably around 300, maybe a little more. Mm. So the herd hasn't grown quite as much as we had hoped it would by this time, but there's probably a couple of reasons. And one is a parasite that we can't really do much about. And it's a common parasite in white-tailed deer, and it doesn't cause problems for whitetails, but it does cause problems for elk. So that's been a little bit of a challenge. And it's a interesting parasite because it actually has to go through a snail as an intermediate host. And it's not that elk are actively pursuing snails to eat. <laughs> if it's on the vegetation and they happen to eat one, that's how they get it. And so Tennessee has a lot of narrow strip benches where you have great opportunities for the snails along the forest edge and you have great opportunities for the whitetails to concentrate with the elk and snails. And so we've had um, quite a bit of problems with meningeal worm is what it's called. So <laughs> all that to say, mortality has been a little bit on the high side, but we are currently looking at potential issues with reproduction as well. And mm -hmm. the herd probably has a lower pregnancy rate than we would expect. And it doesn't seem like it's nutrition related because they do seem to be very healthy. So we are currently monitoring elk cows and looking for when they drop their calves. And then we're going to put collars on the calves to see how well they do and monitor their survival as well. Mm. So, okay, that is very interesting. So does this parasite, or, or are you trying to discover this right now? Are they affecting cows more than bulls or is it they're affecting the babies or the reproductive cycle of the females? Have you been able to identify what this parasite is targeting? And it, um, it does affect young animals. It, typically if they make it to older age, oftentimes they, they'll do okay. And it's a, it's a strange parasite because it can cause central nervous system problems. And basically it migrates up the spinal cord, and gets to the meninges of the brain, which is bizarre. And you can see why it would cause problems. Now, some elk are, are very susceptible to it. Some are more resistant. And it's, it's kind of a fascinating parasite from the standpoint of you have something like moose can't be around whitetails and meningeal worm. If if they are, they will die. Um, mm -hmm. So they are very susceptible. Elk are kind of in the middle, and whitetails are typically not bothered. So it's a deer parasite, deer family parasite that affects a lot of them. But um, it is an odd one. <laughs> so then I would love then if you could explain a little bit more you just briefly mentioned that you are monitoring the females and i know you're doing or working with some very innovative conservation tech to do this so could you like nerd out for a little bit and like <laughs> teach me all about this cool new tech that you are employing to study the the cows and their reproductive rates and uh, I am basically a, a tech nerd at heart, so I um, <laughs> I have to say I do find it amazing. And we've come a long way from the ba basically the radio frequency collars we were using when the elk were first released, you know, back in um, 2000 to what we have now. And so we put out Iridium satellite GPS collars on the cows. And so these collars actually have a link they connect with iridium to send information and to receive information but they also connect to the gps satellites to record locations and then these locations are sent via iridium to our computers so we can actually see where these animals are moving pretty near real time 
which is fascinating. And then they also have a proximity function where they can pick up other frequencies if you tell them, hey, watch out for this particular frequency. And so we're on these females, we're using these vaginal implant transmitters, which kind of look like a, it's basically kind of an IUD looking kind of device that sits up against the cervix. And it is a transmitter as well. And so it's sending off a radio signal that is picked up by the mom's collar because of this proximity function. And so when they give birth, that vaginal implant transmitter comes out basically when they give birth and that changes temperature and quits moving which tells the caller hey birth events occurred here's the gps locations and then the plan is that we will go in and find the calves and put a collar on them and then the calf collar actually talks to the mom collar which is pretty cool that um, it will tell us if they've been separated for more than an hour and it will tell us quite a bit of information about how the calf is doing. So we want to see how well the calves are surviving. And also, interestingly, I guess when the elk were first put in this area, there were no bears and now they're bears. And so, mm. you know, what effect does that have on the calf in terms of recruitment and, you know, helping them in terms of restoring the population? So that's it kind of gets back to the reproductive physiology. It's It's been interesting to, to look at this. And so we are currently off looking for elk calves at the moment. So it's, it's about time. Yeah, and it's birthing season, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. So then does that mean this is brand new tech? This is the first season, the first breeding cycle that you will have been using this brand new tech? That is true in Tennessee yeah people have used this technology for a little while in other places and it just keeps getting better especially when the the implant transmitter talks to the caller that's really been a game changer as opposed to originally when this first came out you had to go out with the receiver and pick up the radio signals and try to determine when you know, the calf was born and then try to find them. So it really is the, the technology keeps moving forward and it's been an exciting time to get involved with this. Mm -hmm. And who, who, like, who's the, con like, who's the tech company that came up with this? So it's a company out of Canada in Ontario called Low Tech. And they actually are a huge company that makes a lot of different transmitters for many different animals. And so monitoring really has gotten much more sophisticated, especially now that we can, you know, receive locations via computer. And they really have, I believe they were the first ones to develop a GPS collar for animals and it was all store on board. So the only way you got your data back was to get the collar back. But now, you know, we can send the, the collar information via another satellite and they have remote drop offs. So if we needed to get the collar back, I can actually go online and say, drop this collar and it has a little box that will drop the collar. <laughs> it's been fascinating to me to see the changes that they've been able to do over time. So once you start collecting the data, what type of questions are you looking to answer? Because one of the ones that you just dropped in there that as a predator biologist, I am super fascinated by is you just said that bears were there. Are you like also gonna be looking at, I mean, oh my gosh, you can answer so many things, the like different types of fatalities. Like why, why is the mortality rate this? Is it because of bears? Is it because of conflict? Is it because of humans? Oh my gosh, I'm assuming that's one of the questions of of all of them that you have. But yeah, what are some of the questions that you're trying to hope to answer with this new tech? Yeah, so ideally, we do want to follow those calves and see, you know, if they die, we want to be able to figure out what they died of. And so if it is a bear attack, then we want to know that. And we'll, we'll definitely be monitoring them and looking at the any potential kill or 
death sites and we will look at is it a potential bear attack is it coyotes is it whatever you know so that we'll we'll do full necropsies on animals that we can and bring them to the university of tennessee vet school to try to figure out what killed them but also you know just basic information uh, we're collecting about the reproductive rate you know in terms of how many cows were pregnant at capture and um it was about 60 percent so you know that seems low, but that's also about what it was when they were first reintroduced here. We ran pregnancy testing on them then, and it was about that. So we want to look at survival for sure, but also movements and how the cows and the calves interact and how long they interact and where do they move during this time. And so we can look at seasonal movements on the cows. And the collars are currently taking locations every three hours. So we kind of know where they're at pretty much all throughout the day. Mm. Yeah, that's so cool. And I would also love to learn more about, because I'm sure, well, okay. Having been in Colorado for a long time, elk is a an interesting topic. It is an interesting thing to touch because it is such a heavily managed species and there's so many different stakeholders that have a voice on how elk are managed. And I would like to adopt that question to the Tennessee elk. Are there other stakeholders involved in this? And what's your relationship to them? What are their opinions on all of this? Is it a hunted population? Is it not big enough to be hunted yet? Is it only government that's working on them or protected areas? But from a, yeah, just a, the human standpoint of this, what are the other groups that are involved with this elk population? Yeah, that is an interesting question. And as you can imagine, there's always a lot of different people, a lot of different opinions and, um, <laughs> You know, for the most part, I think we are at a place where everybody's pretty glad they're there. There's minimal damage to, there's a few people that grow alfalfa and they've had some damage issues and some crop issues that people had in the area, but it's not heavily populated with humans and not a lot of farming. So it's mostly public lands. They're, they are a hunted population. And they're hunting only bulls, which um, given that they're harem species, probably can tolerate a little bit harvest on the bull side, even though the population hasn't just, you know, exploded. <laughs> but there's a lot of interest in people going up and seeing the elk. So there's really a lot of people that that do enjoy having them there. And so, it is interesting because obviously, you know, I suppose some of the local farmers, some of the local ranchers may not appreciate having them there, but I think for the most part, it's been pretty positive. It's, you know, increased economic development in that area and there's a lot of interest on the elk side. So I think it's been mostly positive. Whereas I know in Colorado, there's areas where, you know, it's downtown city and you see a lot of elk walking around and that can be an just, issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a a sight to see for everybody. But yeah, since they are a I mean, it's a trophy. It's a trophy animal. I mean, I've had lots of elk products, elk uh jerky, elk hamburgers, elk, all kinds of different stuff. And it is very good. And and it's almost like a rite of passage for the hunting community to go out there and because they're these animals are really hard to get. Like if somebody is eating an elk that was harvested by someone that they knew like this was it was a big deal to go out and do that having lived for a while on the wild side of rocky mountain national park that was attached to the never summer wilderness area that people could go hunt and the hunting season was there and just seeing what it took for these crews to go in there and even harvest one elk it was very impressive so that's Having seen that and having seen all of the voices that are opposing the wolf restoration project and, and all these other kinds of things, 
that's that's one of my big questions on how that might be similar or different to another population here in the US and you know one that's being restored right now. Do you see a time where maybe if the population grew to a certain point that maybe some of these other I don't know I don't know if they're really problems. I don't know if that's the right term, but these other um aspects of elk management, do you think that they will become a thing when the population reaches a certain point, especially since the East is so much more populated? Granted, Colorado is exploding as well. Um, but yeah, what do you see about the future, I guess, is my question in a roundabout way about this particular population that you're working on? Yeah, those are all good questions. And I don't know that there's ever a simple answer. And you're right. You know, when you think about the contentiousness of the wolf reintroductions or, you know, dealing with a large predator that could eat your dog or your cat or, you know, you worry about small children, you know, those kind of predators, I think, tend to be more of a hot button for people. Now, having said that, um like yeah as this park with elk running around and you worry about vehicle collisions and danger to humans i suppose there's those issues i don't where the elk are in tennessee and kentucky you know it's more rural areas with not a lot of human development now not to say that in the future as everything explodes right that you know we're not going to have some of the same issues but for the most part, I think, and the fact that they are, the public is understanding that they are a hunted species. So it's perhaps also not like maybe wolves or some of the large predators where people maybe don't approve of hunting them. And as you mentioned, you know, a lot of people do eat elk meat. So I think. I think if the herd really exploded and there were issues, and there's mechanisms for dealing with damage permits now where people are able to harvest elk because of damage issues, especially out of the restoration zone. So I don't know what the future holds, <laughs> but I don't anticipate a huge problem. So I guess it's we shall see what happens as this goes <laughs> i guess so i guess so <laughs> and in a similar vein is this project still too early to maybe spur on or incite restoration of other uh, charismatic hooved animals i'm specifically thinking of bison or something I guess that would be the only one I could think of right now that might be historically in that area. Moose, moose were never there, right? Is that is that too southern? You are correct. Yeah, we we did not have moose and the bison issue. You know, it's tough when they, you have a super large hoof stock that is able to roam, and that might be more of a hard sell. Um, and there's pockets, I think, of fenced bison, but. I don't know that you would be able to restore huge herds of bison across the state of Tennessee, unfortunately. And I know um, about the same time they were trying to put red wolves back in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So there, there has been some interest in, you know, even the carnivore side. And unfortunately with red wolves, the problems were too intense, basically. We have too many coyotes, they'll interbreed with coyotes, they get mm. dog and coyote diseases, and so that didn't work. Now the bear restoration has really taken off, maybe not to your question of ungulates, but bears, um, there's been a lot of effort of restoring bear populations, and, and that's actually why there's bears in the elk range now, is because of the successful restoration just west of there at Big South Fork National Park. So that's taken off and done well um that's a good question though <laughs> yeah because i just feel there is this big rewilding movement right now and restoring our lands to what they can be it's impossible now to restore things back to a pristine state that's not possible in a lot of situations but at least we can make an ecosystem whole again 
So, you know, what are those key species that are no longer there? And elk is huge, literally, literally, they're massive animals, like literally, yeah. they are, they're back. And so, yeah, is, is this going to spur other things? And yeah, that's, I mean, that's great to see. Maybe if there was at least an attempt to of a large predator, maybe another one will come in the future if all the other parameters are correct. And yeah, I mean, when, you, when I think of black bears, I think of Great Smoky Mountains. Like I think of Tennessee when I think of a black bear. And it's funny because I've seen them many places and mm -hmm. all of my adventures across the United States. I've seen them in Colorado. I've seen them in Yellowstone. I've uh, obviously I've seen them in the Appalachians. But when I think of black bears, I think of Tennessee. So it is really cool to see how their populations have bounced back. And also from a science nerdy standpoint, it will be really interesting to see if they are having an impact on the reintroduced elk. And before we move on, I almost forgot to ask you something that I found insanely interesting on our last call and going through your research gate. The genetics of <laughs> these elk are unlike anything I've ever heard. So could you by chance just tell me again and then tell everybody listening, why are the genetics of these elk interesting and maybe who they choose to breed with? Yeah, you're right. It's been um, one of the more fascinating questions I've come across and I don't have a good answer as to why it's happening, but all the elk came from this national park in Elk Island. And as I mentioned before, it's, it is a high fenced population. And so it's not a huge national park, but the Northern part of the park was high fenced in about 1907. So it's been a long time. And then the southern part of the park was high fenced in about 1950s, 1960s. And so these are two separate areas that have been separate for obviously a very long time. And so you would expect that if you're trapping on both sides of the park and you take them to a central handling facility, and that's where we put the collars on and we do disease testing and all those things, but they're mixed together and then they're shipped out various places. So we actually embarked on this, which was kind of an interesting thing because I thought, well, if you take these animals and put them in a new home, the females will group back up because females, you know, mom overlaps with daughters and those kind of things. And so we started looking at the genetics of these animals and we have genetic tests from all of them before they were released. So we know which ones we got based on that. So we ended up with um, roughly two thirds of animals from the north side and a third of the animals from the south side of Elk Island National Park. They were mixed together, put on the landscape together. And what we're seeing is very strange that 20 something years later, we're still able to tell which side of the road their ancestors came from. And we're seeing very few mixtures. So it's a very distinctive genotype for the North and genotype for the South. And, you know, like I said, we pick up some mixtures, but it's rare. And we're also seeing segregation of these groups on the landscape. So that's how they're keeping separate. But why they would choose to do that is, kind of the million dollar question. And it's also interesting because we are next to Kentucky and Kentucky got their animals all from ultimately Yellowstone stock. So we can tell when um, looking at the genetic profile when we have Kentucky animals in Tennessee and whether or not they're breeding. And so far it's been, I think we had one mixture between Kentucky and Tennessee, but one, not, yeah, but we're not seeing a whole lot. And, um, but it's fascinating because we can tell, you know, where their ancestors came from. And so that's been a lot of fun. I just don't have a good reason as to why they wouldn't mingle. And, you know, initially it was to look at females, but obviously for it to still be distinct groups, males are involved in this as well. And I think for context, that might be helpful. So, okay, so they were released in 2000. That is 23 years ago now. How long is the average life cycle of an, of an elk? Yeah, and um, typically they, they use like seven years as a, um, 
I'm trying to think what that word is called, but basically, you know, if if you don't start breeding until you're two and a half, how long does it take you to replace your um, genetics? And so it really is kind of a uh, long enough that we should see, you know, animals that are mixing. And, you know, like I said, we pick up some, but it's really not as much as we would have expected by chance. Right. Because, yeah, for context of that, because, you know, it'd be different if it was, you know, a long living animal that had a long gestation period. But yeah, if it, the average lifespan is seven years, well, that's like what? three four generations and you would yeah. think by that amount of time there should be some good mixing going on like hey that bull looks sexy i'm gonna go you know you know mingle with him yeah and, but that's not like that's happening still depending on this what side of the road their ancestors from 23 years ago came from from alberta canada like that's crazy that's crazy yeah it um defies logic you know and um it, the it has to be that they're somehow for whatever reason they are segregating and it has to be particularly during the breeding season and so you do have males and females and with the harem structure you know one male can breed with many females and so you have that going on but why wouldn't a male from whose ancestors were from the other side of the road why wouldn't that matter you know that's such a great question I don't, I wonder if uh, the other populations of elk are as picky or if this is just such a crazy natural experiment that just happened on accident almost. Or, yeah, is that are all elk that picky? Like do Wyoming elk hate Colorado elk or Montana or Idaho elk or Canadian elk or, you know, is it just this? I, I don't know. That That's just. Oh, I love science because I feel like we answer one question and we get about 20 more and we do that every single time. But because when you told me about that, that's immediately what I started to think. I'm like, oh, is this just a natural selection thing or is this just an not artificial because it's happening? It's real um, or just like a man-made cause of selection. I, I don't know, but that's no. cool. I love learning out about these things. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And it's it's pretty cool because other people have seen genetic structuring in populations, but typically it's because there's a a mountain range in between them or they put in a new road and they've kind of segregated to one side of the road or the other. And over time, you see differences in the genetic groups. But this was, you're right, this is a true natural experiment where we've taken them and we've forced them together, <laughs> you know, and watching what they're doing and for for whatever reason they have chosen to separate so that's so cool it sounds like stay tuned you know yeah. you have so much more work to do which is amazing <laughs> you like I, you've been working on this literally since 99 and i there doesn't look like to be an end in sight which is really no, cool no which, which is the fun part of science also the frustrating part of science yeah. <laughs> but you know i i'm going to focus on the fun side of science because yeah. you know the more you, uh, you mention this the more you learn the more you realize you don't know and the more you need to know and you know so it builds on everything for sure yeah, and speaking on building on, since you've had such an impressive career and have become probably the world world expert on Tennessee elk, <laughs> it's how many more people know more than you. I'm sure that though along your journey and you know along this long research gate and everything like that, that you've probably had some difficult times in your journey that maybe stumbled you up or maybe it was really hard to go through was there a particular time along your incredible career or just your life in general that was difficult and might have been a big stumbling block that you would be okay sharing with us mm -hmm. and how you overcome that and or if you're something you're still going through right now that 
you would be willing to share because it's not all just beautiful roses and these beautiful papers and this conservation tech and and all that kind of stuff there we're humans too so is there something that you would be okay sharing with us well first off thanks for the kind words i really appreciate you um <laughs> thank you um i it's a uh, it's been an interesting long road and I suppose probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks, you know, to, to any research is always finding funding. I think funding is a big, unfortunately, a big part of all of this. And so if you can't find funding, you can't do genetic testing, you can't buy Iridium satellite GPS collars, right? So I, I think um, that's sweet of you to say, you know, those kind words about my career but in all reality it's it is a challenge to get the money to do the work and of course it's not just me there's multiple people involved and so it really it um is a great collaboration of a lot of different people putting all of this together so it's it's definitely not one person but I, i'd say funding has been my biggest challenge mm. was there a particular time when maybe you didn't get funding and you weren't able to do something that you were wanting to? Yeah, um, definitely. And it's never been a lack of ideas. Never had a thought of, gosh, I don't know what to look at, <laughs> right? It's always been, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? <laughs> and so, yeah, there's there have been several times in my career where I've really struggled to get the money to do what I would like to do in terms of the science. And that's been probably one of the bigger issues, I suppose. Mm. And on the flip side of that, is there a particular project or a moment in your career where you were the proudest or happiest you'd ever been in that moment? Hmm. Yeah, this is going to sound weird, but it's not. Well, it it is more of the journey, and not. Oh, we finished this, and isn't it great? You know, it's, I guess every every project has been. Well, oh, this is cool. Let's branch off this way if we could, if we had funding. Let's do this, and so I don't know that there's been a. a a stopping point of oh this is great you know <laughs> uh, i can i can definitely see that yeah which is probably the healthiest way to look at it too where you know it's like <laughs> concentrating on the journey versus this end goal in sight so <laughs> it's probably way healthier way to look at your career yes i will agree with that <laughs> Uh, and I always love to ask this question too. If you could impart one piece of advice to me or anybody listening, what is a message that you would love for us to walk away with? Hmm. When you just said that, the, the thing that came to my mind was stick with it and don't give up. I think that's probably, you know, that that's probably the approach to funding too. Okay, so that didn't work. <laughs> Keep at it, you know. That didn't work. I and you know, technology fails, you know, nothing is ever simple, right? Things don't work as you plan, but keep with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such great advice. Sometimes it's so easy to fold in the towel. Like I know that I have I've encountered that many times, just, you know, when your personal life explodes, like it's hard to sometimes keep the professional life going and vice versa. If, you know, you're having issues with what you're doing professionally, sometimes it encrypts into your personal life. And so, yeah, just keep on keeping on, even during the suck, the hard days. And yeah. there's always rewards on the end if you just keep on keeping on. No, and it's funny because, um, I have tried many things and, you know, research-wise, not all of them have worked, clearly. But it's funny because I do feel, mm, I see this more with students nowadays. It's this fear of failure. So 
because they're so worried about failing, they don't even want to try. And mm. I don't know, in academia, I suppose you have to kind of get a thick skin and get used to failure. Your grant proposals, you're not going to get funded. Your paper's not going to get published, you know, all of these things. But you have to keep at it and eventually it will work out. So. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's great for all of us. Remember, don't be afraid to fail because if you fail and you reflect on it and you learn, well, then that's just much that's closer to whatever your end goal is. And so yeah. I know that I've fallen flat on my face multiple times now. And I know that in the moment it sucks, falls, but exactly. <laughs> I can always stand back up much better than before. And so, yeah, don't be afraid to fail. That's that is fantastic advice. Yeah, especially in I mean, I didn't go through a standard academia career. That's just not what I gravitated to, but I've talked to so many people that are deep entrenched in the field. And that does seem to be a very difficult part of it, but to persevere. Yeah. You got to, you know, read those comments and get told no. And, but just keep pursuing on if it's something that you think is really going to bring value to the world, if you answer the question. So yeah, that's great for us to remember. <laughs> And I've probably learned more from my failures than I have from my successes, right? You know, so it's a, it's a learning yeah. experience. And, you know, as long as you're continually learning and moving forward, I think it, it works out. <laughs> yeah, just got to keep remembering that. But, oh, Lisa, you've been so much fun to talk to. And I can't wait to stay in touch to keep up to date with everything elk related because now I'm super interested and I'm super invested and I need to know what's going on with these babies that are dropping. So I will be sure that we stay in touch, but for anybody listening, let's say that they also want to follow and learn about the Tennessee's elk. And as this population expands and see what happens to them, what is the best way for people to keep up with the elk population? Maybe what you're doing, uh, if they want to reach out to you, maybe talk or anything else, what is the best way for listeners to go about that? Yeah, they are welcome to contact me. I'm glad to put them in, in a, the right direction if I can. So um, be glad to share my contact information with you. Which perfect, you perfect. Have. Yeah, yeah. And I could put all of that in the show notes as well. And just out of curiosity, is there like a website or like an Instagram page or a Facebook page or anything that has any uh, science updates that maybe we could keep in touch with? I haven't done real well on <laughs> social media. <laughs> I think it's at Tennessee Deer on Twitter, um, and there is an Instagram, and I can't think of what that is. <laughs> Clearly, I keep up with it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's good. Of course, any relevant uh, links or show or anything, I'll make sure I have them in the show notes so you can send those my way so that we can all keep in touch with what's going on with the Tennessee elk. But yes, Lisa, thanks again for sitting down with me and sharing your wonderful knowledge with everybody in the rewildology community. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. It's been fun. Okay, let's all organize a road trip together and go see the elk herd in person. Oh, the rut will be happening soon. And if you haven't heard an elk bugle before or seen the rut in person, you must, you must add it to your wildlife bucket list. Every September, I'd spend as much time as possible in Rocky Mountain National Park watching all of the drama unfold. It's a truly spectacular sight. <laughs> If you have any questions about today's episode, please submit your question in the Rewildologist Facebook group or go ahead and email them directly to me at hello at rewildology.com. Again, I want to personally thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. Please consider supporting the show however you like, all the ways are awesome, whether it be by subscribing on your favorite podcast app signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter through the website, and you'll never miss a future episode. And I also love to post opportunities in there as well. Following the show on social media, it's everywhere, whatever social media you want, sending a donation to help keep these stores on the airwaves, or purchasing a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love, like the one I'm wearing right now. <laughs> 
Lastly, I want to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. To see the Focusrite gear I use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.